So I'm also going to just get you thinking a little bit about the time of the year that we're in. We're only eight weeks away from celebrating Passover, which is one of the three fe uh, major feasts that the Jewish people celebrate every year. They're not just for the Jewish people, right? They're for all of us. They're God's feasts. And that's the big one because that was the sign that they were coming out of Egypt and they got through the Red Sea and God delivered them. And over and over through the years, as, as you're being raised up as a Jewish child, you're reminded that God is a deliverer. And over and over when he talks about how he wants us to have a heart for the poor, he reminds them, don't forget that you were slaves at one time. So you're not... You're not going to hoard the goods that you get. You're going to remember that but for the grace of God, you were in that condition. But I freed you and I delivered you. Now, we celebrate Easter at that time of year as Christians, but Passover and Easter were never meant to be separated, okay? It's the resurrection of Jesus is the sign of coming out of Egypt and coming through the Red Sea. And now we come through the Red Sea blood of Jesus Christ for our salvation. How many have been delivered from the slavery of sin? I'm going to wait till every hand goes up because if you're a Christian, you've been delivered from the slavery to sin. When, when the boss snaps his fingers, you just say, how high? He wants you to jump. When you're a slave to something, you have no control over it. And now the Bible says we're slaves to Christ. All right? That we are bond slaves willingly surrendering our lives to his will over our lives. And even Bob Dylan got it when he got saved. He said, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And I made a decision a long time ago. I may not fully understand every verse of every text in the Bible, but I am going to serve you, Lord, because I know how bad it was when the devil was in control of my life. And I am now surrendering to you and be that as it may, I will be as obedient as I'm, I'm able to be. And I ask you to keep making me more obedient every day. So only eight weeks. And the word there around that whole theme of coming out of Egypt is redemption. Okay, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. How many times we've said that in our lives? That is the thing that saved us. But we're empowered by the resurrection. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if, if it's just the cross, then, you know, if there's no resurrection, then your faith is in vain. It's only because he rose from the dead. Being crucified was the sacrifice, but then coming out of that tomb was the consecration, the life that came, the conquering of death. And whenever death is trying to grip you, you can speak to it and say, no, Jesus conquered you, death. Oh, death, where is your sting? I'm, I'm walking in that redemption now and in that freedom, and I have the mind of Christ. So here they use the word ransom, which I just love. It just so struck me that Jesus pays a ransom for our freedom. It's like we were bound in sin, and all of a sudden through his blood, picture that being the, the price that was paid for your freedom. You got taken out of that slavery to sin by the ransom price of Jesus' blood. And there are certain portions of scripture I want to take you to in Isaiah. So if you go to that next slide, please, that's from Isaiah chapter 45. And uh, it talks about Cyrus, but there's promises in here. And it's one of the things I would encourage you to do is when you get on your knees in the morning to pray, look for the promises in the word of God and put your name in there and put it for today. Today, I proclaim this over myself, Lord. We'll just read it and then look for the promises. It says in Isaiah 45, 1, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness. Say that with me. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret Please say that again. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, am God of Israel. Amen? So these are promises that we can say on our knees at the beginning of the day. This is the God that I serve. This is what you can do for me. You can unlock all these mysteries that I might face today. And the tricky thing is you don't always know what they're going to be in the morning. But you could say, I'm putting my armor on now, God. I'm not walking out of here unprepared for what's coming. I don't know the specifics, but I know who I serve. And I know that you do. And if you could stay ahead of me, look at the, I found seven promises. Subdue nations. All right, so we already talked about witchcraft in the atmosphere. It's, it might be on the rise, but Jesus is already risen above it all. 
All right, so that nation is subdued, loosing the armor of kings. So God's able to unbuckle the, the armor of the enemy against you and, and dethrone that enemy. Three, open up the double doors before us. So as we go forward, he opens up the double doors before us so that the gates cannot be shut. You know, it's really nice when you have double doors. There's no way that you can't get anything through the double door. And that's what God is saying. I'm going to go before you and open up the double door. And I'm going to make the crooked places straight. And most of the time when we're talking to people about trying to overcome sin, this past week we were talking about helping heal victims of sexual abuse. We need to talk about a crooked way that needs to be straightened out. But God, but God, no matter how tangled our lives have gotten through abuse that happened to us, but God. And I'll, I'll encourage all of you, if you weren't in the class, you maybe didn't hear me say this, but there's a video on YouTube from Joyce Meyer called One Life. And she goes through her own testimony of overcoming horrendous abuse from her father and now being used by the Lord to touch millions of people around the world. So what the devil means for evil, what? God is a God of the turnaround. What the devil means for evil, God turns into life. That's what Joseph said to his brothers. Don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. I know you're worried right now. But he, when he told them who he was, he says, no, you guys meant it for evil, but God had a different plan. So even the horrible things that have happened to us, God can still turn it around. And then uh, it says, I love six and seven. Well, no, we'll do five. The fifth promise is, I'll break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. Man, right in this one little three-verse piece, we're coming up with seven promises. He's going to eliminate the barrier in front of me. He's cutting the bronze. He's taking out the iron. I'll give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. There's something about your spirit hearing you say this in the morning right? When you're on your knees, don't pray quietly. Speak it out loud. Speak the promises of God out loud. It's how we're wired. We want to hear our own voices. Decade of the degree, the decree. Don't just think it in your brain. Say it out loud. I'm really getting insight on that one. Even when we sing together, when we're here together and we're, we're combining our voices. You know, did you ever notice if somebody doesn't have a great voice, you don't notice because there's 300 people singing? <laughs> So he makes it all a joyful noise. It all blends together. And in music, they call that a passing note. Even if you make a mistake, you can blend it right in, and God will turn it around and use it for his good. And that's all he cares is that you're releasing the sound. But something about the multiplication when we're together causes power. And your spirit reacts to your voice. So stop calling yourself a loser. Stop saying, I can't believe what an idiot I am. God is not saying that about you. You don't say things that he doesn't say about you. Did you make a mistake? Sure. We all make mistakes. We don't have 100% 20-20 vision in advance. We have to live life. It deals with different hands. But watch what you say about yourself to yourself and speak it out. And the more you sing worship songs and the more those songs line up with the word of God, I'm telling you, your whole life changes. So do this in the morning. Don't wait till night. You're too tired, and the morning sets you up for your whole day. So that portion, 45, 1, 2, and 3, was basically what God said he would do for us. Now say this with me. I can do things for him. <laughs> it might sound funny that he needs us to do anything for him, but it's really more for us what we do for him is that we prepare our hearts. And we say, I choose to be obedient to you today, Lord. I'm making a choice. And that was something else we talked about Tuesday night, if you were in the class. We have to make a choice to forgive the people that hurt us. That does not come naturally to us, right? Because we have this self-preservation mode that we all have, that we were born with. And somehow, we translate forgiving somebody with letting them off the hook. And potentially making ourselves vulnerable again. And it's like, nope. I have to make a choice to forgive because I have to realize staying, holding unforgiveness in my heart is more poison to me than the person that I'm holding it against. And I win when I forgive them. It's a hard truth, isn't it? But this is what it says in Isaiah 40, which is the next slide, right? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. That's Isaiah 40, verse 3. John the Baptist quoted that about himself. This is who he said he was, the one who's a voice in the wilderness saying, prepare a way for the Lord. So what's the obligation on our heart when we're on our knees first thing in the morning, still groggy, 
right? You haven't had your coffee yet because you want that communion cup first, before the coffee. Let that be the first thing in your mouth. And you're saying, Lord, I am going to prepare a landing strip in my heart for your presence. As I sit here this morning, I want you in me richly. And I'm going to prepare the ground. And back in the day, when the emperors were in charge, when they were in Rome, right, my, my family relatives back there in the days of Rome, there wasn't a lot of statues in Rome of the emperor because he was right there. But when you went out into outer provinces, that's when you would see the statues. Because the, the, my, my uh, distant relative had a big ego problem, and he was afraid that people weren't going to worship him if they didn't see the statue of him. But God says that we are his ambassadors out in the far and strange places. So we are representing the Lord whenever we go into these places of darkness. So now they're, they're in this, let's say it's kind of a backwoods town and they don't have much in the way of highways, so they would have to prepare the way for the emperor. Because if he was coming in, he wanted a smooth landing strip for his chariot and for all the people that were with him. So out of respect to the dignity of the king, the emperor, they would get the road crew out and they would smooth out that road. And the two things that could happen is you could have divots in the road and you could have bumps in the road, right? So look what it says. Prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. My day might feel a little empty like a desert, but I'm preparing the way for him to come in. And then he says, every valley shall be filled in or exalted. So wherever there was a rut, I'm filling that in. Why? Because I'm making a smooth landing place for him. So what could that rut be in my life in the morning is I don't like my boss. <laughs> I feel like that was what happened this morning. Like somebody's really not looking forward to going to work tomorrow. That's, that's like the enemy stealing your time right now. Say, no, devil. You're not robbing my time with worry because I'm afraid that I might hit this guy tomorrow. <laughs> Depending on your background, that could be an option. Not a good option. But maybe you're not going to hit them, but you're going to write a, an email to human resources and complain about them. Who knows? The devil wants you in your flesh. God wants you operating in your spirit. And if you're not making the choice for a landing strip for his presence, it's much easier to get in the flesh. So you have to be intentional and say, I'm filling in that rut. No way. I'm filling that in. I want a smooth place. And anywhere there's speed bumps, anywhere something got bumped up in front of me, I'm taking that down because I want you to have a smooth ride on the way into my life. So what is it, Lord, that I've been grinding about? What have I been worried about? What have I been avoiding? That's usually the biggest problem in your life is the thing you've been avoiding the longest. <laughs> Sorry. Like, I want to be happy when I come to church. Well, you will be as soon as you stop avoiding that thing. Pay that bill. <laughs> You'll realize the devil was making a huge mountain out of it. And as soon as you're done with it, like, oh, that wasn't such a big deal. I don't know why I was avoiding it so long. Because he wants to keep you in that place of tension. No, he's a liar. Every valley will be filled. Every mountain will be brought low. The crooked places will be made straight. So if I'm expecting the emperor to come into town, I want him to have a smooth ride. And that's what I'm saying. You are the emperor, Lord. And you're coming into my heart because you reside in me. So crooked places are going to be made straight. If I still have untended to business, I will tend to that business. So that's one less thing that the enemy can use against me. The rough, I'm sorry, uh, made straight. The rough places will be made smooth. And then what happens in verse 5? The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And, and that's every one of us. No matter how secular the environment that you're in, the glory of the Lord is revealed through his people. We carry his presence and we reveal it the closer we are to him. So why wouldn't you want to start your day on your knees in the morning? And you say, well, I'm already getting up as early as I can get up and I have to go to the gym. Well, this is way more important than gym. This is Jesus over gym. <laughs> You can go to the gym. I'm not saying don't do that, but don't make that a priority over him. Oh, but there'll be a longer line at the gym. Hey, you got to trust God, okay? Trust God. Get up a little bit earlier. Go to bed a little bit earlier. You don't want to be trying to read the word late at night because it's, you just don't have the same energy level. This is my experience. Maybe you're different. But I want to go to Revelation 5. Let's go to that next verse because now we get a scene from heaven. 
And why can't we have scenes right now? We can. We're alive. That's the spirit that lives inside of us. When we were worshiping this morning, the angels in heaven were worshiping with us. Okay? It's, it's the, the line between the spiritual and the secular gets moved away. And we are entering in with them and they are entering in with us. And that's the presence of God. That's what we call the anointing. You could sense the anointing when we're all together. It's like you you know that there's an angelic presence with you because it resonates with God. And if you're watching something that you shouldn't be watching, they're not there <laughs> because that's not holy. And they're honoring. They're crying out to God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So if you're doing something that's not holy, they can't be in that party. That's counterfeit. Revelation 5.1, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, and it was sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. So this is John that's speaking. He was in the scene, and now we see some tension that the Father, right, that's the one who sits on the throne, is the Father, and he has a scroll in his hand, and an angel says, who can open this scroll? How does that apply to our daily lives? I think it's very present help if we see this scene a certain way. It's not the only way to look at it, I'm sure. It's just what I feel the Lord showed me. The scroll can be many things. But I look at it in the morning when I'm praying as the game plan for the day. The strategy of the perfect will of God for my life that day. There's certain things that are constant in that, and then there's certain things that are variable based on what's going on in my life. I went through a time when my father was in the hospital, my mother was having problems, my sister was having problems, and it was like dial a crisis, like which one's going to be today? And then I go into other seasons where there's not so many issues going on. So the constants are, I'm staying true to you, Lord. I'm going to be obedient. The blessing comes from obedience. The variables are, what is the plan for today? And each day, if I'm listening and I'm asking, he'll help me. So the scroll could be looked at as my DNA. Who did God call me to be? What is my specific plan? I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. It's like a blueprint, like a DNA pattern for you, but it also could be the daily orders, the instructions, the strategy that I have for you. If it's the, if it's the summer, you don't bring a snow shovel outside, do you? Right? Because you're current. You know what's happening. So what season am I in, Lord? The sons of Issachar, they knew the times and the seasons, and they knew what Israel should do. That's what a prophetic lifestyle looks like. But the tension is there's nobody here to open up this scroll. Now, wouldn't it be tempting to just open it on your own because you get tired of waiting for God to do it? That's a big mistake. How many know the lumps on your head from that one? Yeah, just rushing and not waiting on God. Every one of us here, if we're honest, I'm not going to call you out for lying if you didn't raise your hand, but we all have made those mistakes. And, and he wants us to learn from those mistakes. So it's like, wait a minute, Jesus is the only one that can crack the seal on the scroll. Everybody else is a counterfeit. And they may look like they know what they're talking about because the devil sets himself up like an angel of light. And he's the best liar that's ever been because he's had the most practice. He's the father of lies. So don't be in a rush to make important decisions. Wait until you get a release from the Lord. Why am I saying that? Because I didn't do that for a long part, a big time in my life, even as a Christian. I didn't ask. I just didn't spend enough time waiting on the Lord and listening. And I regret that. But I can't go back and change it, right? That's looking in the rearview mirror. You're supposed to look through the windshield and say, yes, I'm going to learn from those mistakes that I made, and I'm going to get on my knees and pray every morning to start the day and, and at least ask him what the plan is. Lord, can you crack the seals of the scroll and show me the plan for today? Is that helping you at all? Yeah. All right. So I saw in the right hand of Father, him who sits on the thro a throne, a scroll written, and then there was a strong angel. No one was able, and then we're going to go to verse 5. It says, but one of the elders said to me, behold, the, do not weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seals. Who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? The name above all names. 
the only one worthy of all our praise. My heart will sing, how great is our God. He's on your side. Oh, why? Because he loves you. Why? We don't know. <laughs> That's a hard one to figure out. He just does. You just have to accept that. Did you earn it? No. But does he love you? Yes, because you're his child, and nobody is too far away from that love. I will crack the seal for your day, he's saying. That's what this angel said. One of the elders, sorry. Don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. So that's, that's my savior. That's what I'm on my knees and I don't know what to do. And how many of you have been in situations where there's five choices for the situation and they're all bad? <laughs> and you're just trying to pick the least worst one. We say in Wall Street, the tallest midget. Because <laughs> none of them look good to me. But God will help you. The problem is, if we're not even asking, then how can we blame him for not helping us? <laughs> and then in Isaiah 11:10, it says, In that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. So there's that phrase in Revelation 5 that says, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David... The Jewish people that knew the scripture would have known in that day, nations will resort to the root of Jesse. Now, who would that be? In the natural, it was David, but then in the spirit, it's Jesus. And that's why in the New Testament, they wanted to make sure whoever this Messiah was came from the line of David, in the lineage of David, right? So he's going to stand. What will he do? Isaiah said, prophetically, he will stand as a signal for the people, so almost like a lighthouse. You can think of a lighthouse as a signal. In the midst of a storm, you see this bright light flashing to let you know where you're supposed to go. In the, uh, I don't know if you know this, but down um, on the Outer Banks in North Carolina, one of the things the pirates would do is set up a fake signal on the shoals. So in the storm, people that were caught out on, on the sea in the storm would come and, and crash their ship on the shoals because it was a fake lighthouse. You want a picture of the devil? There it is, right? He's a liar. He makes it look so appealing, but he's a liar. No, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. That's the true signal. He's going to be like a signal for the people, and his resting place shall be glorious. So now we have the father on the throne, and then we have this root. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is going to prevail and open the scroll. So let's go to verse 6. And then it says, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Well, wait a minute. The angel said, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and now he's saying it's a lamb. Which is it? Both. <laughs> Does that tell us something? And what about David? Can you see lion and lamb in one person? Why? Well, the lion part, we know he killed Goliath. And we know he killed a lion and a bear, so he clearly was a brave man. That was the testimony that they had about him. But then they also said, if you need to drive out an evil spirit from Saul, get this kid David. He really has an anointing on his life when he worships. Bring a harp. Well, a harp is a guitar. I hate to break the news. But God loves guitars. <laughs> so you say, just tell David to bring his guitar over here and start playing and singing, and that spirit's gone. Because the anointing breaks the yoke. The same courage that caused him to kill Goliath could be turned around into a sensitivity to listen to God and not have to kill the, the, the spirit with violence, but to drive it out by the anointing. What about you? What's the lesson for us? You have to be courageous. You have to be willing to take a stand. You can't let people run over you. Jesus did it. He flipped over the tables when, when that was the appropriate thing to do. But you also have to be sensitive enough to know when you don't use force. You have to be able to protect yourself, but you don't have to get run over. All right, so this wonderful scene in heaven. It says, in the midst of the elders around the throne, the lamb, as though it had been slain, they could see it. Then he came and took the scroll from who? His father. Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand of the father. And it says that the lamb came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures saw the lamb had taken the scroll and they fell face down at the feet of the lamb and they worshiped him. And each of them had a harp and golden bowls brimming full of sweet fragrant incense, which are the prayers of who? Me and you. 
Believe that? You put your name in here? That your prayers are up in heaven as sweet incense? And he's coming and cracking the scroll open for you as you spend time in prayer. I hate to tell you, there were times in my life I went long periods without praying. That's really not a good confession, is it? Because that means you're relying on the arm of the flesh. And that's not going to get you good results, I promise. So, look, we're not, we're not there. We're looking through the windshield, not in the rearview mirror. I am proposing every day I have an altar, and there's a war to try to take that altar away from me, but I'm going to let Jesus win the war. He takes the scroll from the Father, and he's the one that opens it up and shows me what to do. I'm telling you, second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, there's no time that he doesn't care about your decisions that you're making. And why not just lean into that and say, Lord, I don't want to do it unless you're telling me to do it. You can develop your hearing that clearly. So each had a harp and bowl. Now, what about this? I, I just, I was reading um, some commentaries. It says, they're fused, the lion and the lamb inside of Jesus are fused together. So that's a picture for us to be the warrior, but also to walk in the anointing, to break the yoke as a worshiper. So warrior and worshiper is like lion and lamb. That's our common ground that we have today. And then the victory that was won by the lion was accomplished by the submission of the lamb. So by you saying, I choose to submit to you today, Lord, you're taking that forceful part of your personality and saying, I give it to you and you control it. And if I need to use it, I will, but I will only do it under your direction. I'm only flipping over the tables if you tell me I have to do that. Because the thing as a Christian that we never can deal with that issue of being forceful isn't right either. All right. And then it says um, there's a currency flowing through the umbilical cord between the father and the son. I love this picture. And the currency flowing through the umbilical cord between the father and the son is Holy Spirit. That's the connection. How many of you here have Holy Spirit living in you? It's a trick question. You should all raise your hand. Okay. You have Holy Spirit living in you. If you call Jesus Christ your Savior, he's inside of you. Maybe not operating in the fullness of what he wants to do, but he's there. And he wants to be let out. Okay? Don't keep him locked in the closet. So Jesus comes and he represents this first, uh, he represents the replacement of the first Adam with the second Adam. And that's what I could say when I get on my knees. I could say, Lord, my carnal nature does not want to serve you, does not want to submit to you, wants to be lazy today, wants to be a spiritual couch potato. <laughs> but the Jesus in me wants to be a roaring lion and a worshiping lamb. Who's going to win the war for my altar? <laughs> the roaring lion and the worshiping lamb. This is not decaf Christianity. But that witch in Jersey City ain't taking decaf either, okay? She's full force. She's, she's booked. She's got plenty of appointments booked of people who are going to the dark side for the answer instead of going to the right side, going to Jesus. That's going to change, amen? So we have this connection between the authority of the Father and the submission of the Son and the connecting power between the two of Holy Spirit like an umbilical cord flown between them. And it's a spiritual thing that we have access to. So all of us have the model of the submission to the Son and the authority of the Father and Holy Spirit in us, driving us with this energy. Now, you don't have to plug yourself in to get a recharge on Holy Spirit. He's uh, the solar power of the universe, <laughs> okay? He's never out of energy. Holy Spirit doesn't say, oh, man, I'm exhausted. Sorry, I can't help you right now. You're going to have to come back tomorrow after I've had a chance to rest. <laughs> Ongoing. Oh, I love this one in Revelation uh, 5, 9 now. You know, we're getting past that part of the scene. And, and it says in, in that last one, they fell down face down at the feet of the lamb and worshiped him. And each of them had a harp, which is a guitar. I'm telling you, it really is. Believe me. And golden bowls, brimming full of sweet, fragrant incense, which are the prayers of God's holy lovers. He just loves this atmosphere. Just like if you're a parent, you love it when your children come to you and ask for advice. Don't you? Please say yes. That's what, that's what God would want. Like, kid, leave me alone. Please, don't do that. 
They're not your kids. They're his kids. And if they come to you with a question, oh, boy, we're getting some really good stuff going on in the, in the audience right now. Like if they come to you and say, hey, Dad, why is this? Why is that? Don't say, because I said so. God doesn't ever do that, okay? That's a little bit uh, disrespectful to the child, don't you think? It's like, what do you mean because you said so? That's not a real answer. That's like a stall. No, you might have to boil it down for me. I don't know why the sky is blue, but because I said so, that's probably not the best answer, is it? So he doesn't do that to us. If we're hungry, he'll fill us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be. That's what he said. So now they're all singing, verse 9 in Revelation 5, a new song of praise to the Lamb. Don't you love that? Prophetic church that you are. How many new songs are coming out today? They were just being plated uh, right on the altar. New song, new song, new song. That's what he wants. There's this interconnection with us that he wants to speak through us and sing through us. And take your word and start reading Psalms and start singing what the Lord is showing you. It'll, it'll liven your life. And they start singing this new song, because you were slaughtered for us, you are worthy to take that scroll with the seven seals, and you're, well, you're worthy to open its seals. Your blood was the price paid to redeem us. That's the ransom. I was a slave. I was being held in slavery. Somebody came and paid the ransom. It was the blood of Jesus that got me out. You talk about coming through the Red Sea. Boy, I'll tell you what. You came through the Red Sea of the blood of Jesus on the way out of your slavery to sin. Can we go back into that slavery? We can. You can return to the bondage that once had you. Paul warns about this in the New Testament. He told the Galatians, wait, wait what are you doing? Are you going back to the bondage that you came out of? Don't do that. Don't be a man pleaser. Be a God pleaser. It's a different day's subject, but just recognize why we have to stay sharp on our knees every day, lying in the lamb, communicating with heaven. Look, it doesn't have to be nine hours. We still have to pay our bills. We still have to go to work. Hopefully when we get our review, it's a good review because that's what the Lord would want, right? You would want the boss saying, boy, I wish I had 10 more just like Trish. Yeah, there was a day in her life she has a testimony that it wasn't like that, but then the Lord came in and changed her. And all of a sudden, she's in demand. Your blood was the price. Oh, thank him for that. That paid to redeem us. You purchased us to bring us to God. Only Italians, though. <laughs> no, no, I know. It's not, it's not what it says. Out of every tribe... Every language, people group, every language, every people group, every nation. I love that about our church. We are multi-ethnic, very diverse, beautiful church. God loves the tapestry of all of us here. Every one of us count to him. You have chosen us to serve our God and formed us into a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. Whew. Just remind yourself of this. This is like putting fuel in the tank in the morning. Before you leave the house. Oh, yeah, devil. Who the heck do you think you're lying to? This is what it says about me. My God paid the ransom for me with his blood. He chose me to serve him and form me with my brothers and sisters. Who, in the natural, we might look like F Troop, you know? Remember that show? Where the heck are we? <laughs> hey, like I, that was a popular show when I was growing up. Like, they were kind of like the gang that couldn't shoot straight. But that just proves the power of God. Because in the natural, we don't have all the uh, anointing on paper. We don't have all the goods and the talent in the natural. But he works through us. And that proves it has to be him, doesn't it? So there's no place for us to get on a high horse and get too arrogant about it. He made us into a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. She's happy about this message, I could tell. She's saying, praise the Lord, Pastor Pete, preach it. Hey, do me a favor. Just show them how beautiful she looks today. You just got to see this outfit she has on. How? Oh! Show that side. <laughs> she knows good preaching when she hears it. See, she was... 
helping me on there. I would like to, you know, for time's sake, uh, let's just jump. No, nah, I think I'm good. Okay, never mind. Daniel 7 this is a great picture. There's so much linkage. With, we, we already looked at Isaiah, and now we look at Daniel chapter 7, which is a very prophetic chapter in the Old Testament. And it says, the enemy was making war against the saints. Think that's still happening today? Okay, that's, that doesn't seem to be a, that's a constant. That doesn't change. The enemy was making war against the saints. What are the saints going to do about it? We're going to fight back. We're not going to hide in the bunker. We're going to fight back. That's what you do in a war. You fight. You don't watch. And prevailing against them until what happened? Until the Ancient of Days came. Who might that be? The Lion Lamb. That's it. He's the Ancient of Days. The enemy was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. That's us. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. You see how much that links up with what we just read in Revelation? In Revelation, it said, you purchased us to bring us to God out of every tribe and chosen us to serve our God who formed us into a kingdom of priests who reigned in the earth. So that's New Testament. And then this is Old Testament. When the Ancient of Days came, it came time for us, the saints, to possess the kingdom. And then verse 27 in Daniel 7 says, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. You believe that? So do you believe right now you're in training for reigning? All right. That's true. You are. Might not always feel that way in the role that you're in, and you might feel a little insignificant. You're not. If you're a Christian, you can't be insignificant because you're carrying the presence of God with you. And it's like, yeah, but who would want the job I have? I'm not with anybody important. Oh, yes, you are. Those people you're with are very important to God. I don't know if my sister-in-law, Linda, is here right now. She was telling me something. She's a, an evangelist on her job. And a lady came to her, and, and, and it was a, they were new. And, tr and Linda said something like, praise the Lord. And the lady looked at her. Are you one of those kooks? And Linda is very confident. I'm not going to tell it as well as she would, but I'll get her to tell it. And she said, oh, why? Do you think Christians are kooky? And uh, the lady said, yeah, you know, I, that's not my thing. And Linda said, oh, well, what is your thing? <laughs> what do you do? Like, how do you make your decisions? I mean, it's so confident, right? What a great response. And the lady was like, well, you know, I just go by whatever I think is the right thing to do. And Linda said, oh, yeah, I used to do that, too. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like rolling right off. And the girl said, well, what do you mean? And, and Linda said, well, you make a lot of mistakes that way, don't you? If you just go by your feelings, because a lot of times your feelings will betray you, won't they? And, and you know, like she told me the girl was feeling, I've got to get out of here because she's trying to trap me. And Linda's like, no, I wasn't trying to trap her. It's like, no, I just found a better way. And if you think that's kooky, that's fine. But let's compare notes in a couple of months and see who's made better decisions. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.